Hello! The focus of this video is the polymerase chain reaction, otherwise known as PCR. PCR is a widely used technique with many different applications, from DNA sequencing to cloning. In the general sense, it's used to amplify and make billions of copies of any target DNA sequence. In this video, we'll show you how PCR is used to clone a gene into an expression plasmid. However, before we begin our experiment, let's discuss the fundamental concepts involved in PCR. Every PCR reaction begins with a sample of the template DNA at room temperature, around 20 to 25 degrees C. We then increase the temperature to 95 degrees Celsius. At this high temperature, the strands of the DNA double helix melt apart, leaving two single strands with exposed bases. The temperature is then reduced to an intermediate value somewhere between 45 and 60 degrees Celsius. This is still too warm for the large strands of our template DNA to reanneal. However, shorter pieces of primer DNA can reanneal at these intermediate temperatures, as shown here. Note that only half of the bases in each primer are actually complementary to the template DNA sequence. The other half, which are not complementary and shown in red, represent our restriction sites. Once the primers are bound, the temperature is increased to 68 degrees Celsius. This is the optimum operating temperature for the TAC polymerase enzyme that's used in PCR. The TAC polymerase binds to any double-stranded primer template DNA complexes and then synthesizes DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction until the temperature is once more increased to 95 degrees C to melt apart all of the double-stranded DNA. This process is repeated several times until we finally end up with several copies of our desired DNA product, shown here in the rectangles. You can see that these products are exactly as long as the target gene, and they're flanked by two restriction sites. Each subsequent cycle after this step will multiply the concentration of these products exponentially until we obtain several billion copies of our modified gene. So to review, the first step in PCR is denaturation, or melting of the DNA double helix. The sample is then cooled to 45 to 60 degrees C to allow primers to anneal. Once the primers have annealed, the temperature is increased to 68 degrees C, and TAC polymerase begins to copy the DNA. These steps are usually repeated for about 20 to 40 cycles to obtain a sufficient amount of DNA. At this point, you should be able to tell that primers are a very important part of the PCR reaction. So let's discuss how we design primers for PCR. First of all, you'll need to obtain the sequence of your target DNA. You can then use this sequence to design two different primers, a forward and a reverse primer. These primers are usually 20 to 30 base pairs long and share at least 50% complementarity with the target region. For example, Shown in the bottom left is our forward primer. We begin designing this primer by selecting at least 12 to 15 bases that are exactly complementary to the target gene sequence, shown here in green. Next, we add the bases for our restriction sites on the five prime end of our complementary sequence. These bases do not have to be complementary to the target gene sequence. Finally, we add three random base pairs to the five prime end of the restriction site. These are called protecting bases, and they help to increase the efficiency of the restriction digest reaction that we'll do later on. If you omit these protecting bases, your restriction digest may work poorly or not at all. So now we have our forward primer. It's at least 50 to 60% complementary to my target gene sequence, and it has a restriction site and some protecting bases on the five prime end. Remember that the restriction site and protecting bases do not need to be complementary to the target gene sequence. Finally, it always helps if the last base on the three prime end of your primer is either a C or a G. This will ensure that the three prime end stably binds to the template DNA, allowing TAC polymerase to start copying. If this were an A or a T, then we may not get stable binding and the TAC polymerase would not be able to start. Notice that for my reverse primer, I used all of the same steps, except my complementary region is the reverse complement of the target gene sequence. For example, my reverse primer does not read GTTG in the 5' to 3' prime direction. Instead, it's the reverse complement. It reads CAAC in the 5' to 3' prime direction. 
you must be very careful to make sure that this reverse primer is the reverse complement, otherwise your PCR reaction will not work. The final step in primer design is to check the melting temperatures of both primers. Each primer should have a melting temperature somewhere between 45 and 60 degrees C. Higher melting temperatures can sometimes be okay, but primer melting temperatures below 40 to 45 degrees Celsius can create some significant problems. This is because some primers lose their specificity at these lower temperatures and start binding to other sites besides your target gene. This lowers the overall efficiency of the PCR reaction and can lead to the creation of other PCR products that are not your target gene. For that reason, it's very important to make sure your primer melting temperatures are between 45 and 60 degrees Celsius. You should also try to make sure that the primer melting temperatures are as close as possible and are no more than 5 degrees Celsius away from one another. Once you have the melting temperatures for your primers, you can set up your PCR routine. PCR routines usually begin with an initial denaturation step at 90 to 97.5 C that lasts for about 2 to 5 minutes. This long initial melting step is needed to fully melt apart all of your template DNA. However, once you begin your cycles, the melting step only needs to be 15 to 30 seconds long. Next, in the cycle annealing step, the temperature is decreased to 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. You'll want to use a temperature here that is 5 degrees lower than the lowest melting temperature out of both of your primers. For example, if the melting temperatures of your primers are 55 and 50 degrees Celsius, you'll want to subtract 5 from 50 to use a temperature of 45 degrees Celsius in this step. Notice that the length of the cycle annealing step is very similar to the cycle melting step. It's around 15 to 30 seconds. However, the length of the cycle extension step in which the DNA is being copied is directly proportional to the length of your target gene. You'll want to use about one minute for every thousand base pairs that you're copying. For example, if your target gene is 2,500 base pairs, you'll want to use two and a half minutes. The temperature of the extension step is pretty consistent between 68 and 72 degrees Celsius. Uh, you want to check the manufacturer's instructions to see what the exact optimum temperature is, since some polymerase is like 68, others like 72. At any rate, once you have all these temperatures and times plugged in, you want to tell your thermal cycler to repeat them 25 to 35 times. And once those cycles are complete, finish it off with a final extension step still at 68 to 72 degrees C but for at least two minutes per thousand base pairs. This final extension step allows TAC polymerase to come back in and finish copying any incomplete PCR products. Overall depending on the length of your target gene this whole process would take around one to four hours for genes that are between 500 and 2000 base pairs. All right, now that you have a good grasp on the concepts, let's actually perform a PCR reaction. Begin by thawing out all of your different reagents. You'll need some template DNA, not very much, only about one nanogram, and your forward and reverse primers. If you order these from a company, they'll arrive in dry form, and you'll need to resuspend them in 1 ml of milliq water. You'll also need a PCR master mix. This master mix contains the TAC polymerase, reaction buffer, base pairs, and magnesium chloride that you'll need to successfully complete PCR. Once your primers and template DNA samples are fully thawed out, you want to vortex them briefly to make sure they are completely mixed. Next, get a new 0.2 ml PCR tube like the one shown here. Begin mixing your reagents by transferring one nanogram of template DNA into the PCR tube. This can be as little as 0.5 to 1 microliter, so make sure you work very carefully. Next, add 1 microliter of each of the forward and reverse primers. These volumes may vary somewhat, but you want to make sure that you have a final primer concentration of 0.2 micromolar. Finally, add your PCR master mix to the tube. Once you've added it to the tube, pipette it up and down a few times to make sure that everything is very well mixed.
seal the tube and bring it over to the thermal cycler. Carefully place your tube into the correct well on the thermal cycler array and then tightly shut the lid. Next, program your PCR routine into the thermal cycler. Notice here we have an initial melt step of 95C for 3 minutes. We're going to change that to 5 minutes. Next, we have our cycle melting step, which is 95C for 30 seconds. For our annealing step, we're going to change the melting temperature to 49 degrees C, which is what works for our primers. We're also going to change the time for this step to 15 seconds. For the cycle extension step, we're going to change the temperature to 68 degrees C because that's what the manufacturer recommends for our specific polymerase. We're also going to change the time from 1 minute to 50 seconds because our target gene is 800 base pairs long. Finally, we're going to repeat these cycle steps 35 times. Lastly, for the final extension step, we're also going to decrease the temperature from 72 to 68 degrees C, and we're going to let that go for 5 minutes. We're also going to program a final hold step at 4 degrees C. When we hit run, the machine will ask us to confirm the volume of a reaction, which is 50 microliters, so we're good to go. A screen like this will then come up to show us how much time we have remaining. Once your PCR reaction is finished, you'll want to image the PCR products on an agarose gel. To do so, you'll have to add DNA loading buffer to the PCR sample. Here I'm adding 12 microliters of 5x concentrated loading buffer to a 50 microliter sample. So here we have the agarose gel itself. The first thing you'll want to do is load 10 to 20 microliters of a DNA base pair ladder onto the gel. This ladder contains multiple bands of known length that will allow us to confirm the length of our PCR product. For example, we have an 800 base pair product, so we'll want to make sure that aligns with the 800 base pair band in our ladder. Next, we'll load our PCR product. Since the wells of this gel can only hold 30 microliters and we have a 50 microliter PCR reaction, I'm going to split it into two 25 microliter samples in separate wells. Notice here, very importantly, that I'm skipping a well between the ladder and the PCR product to avoid any potential cross-contamination. I'm also loading the sample very slowly. You don't want to do this very quickly, otherwise your sample will squirt out all over the place. Once your samples are loaded, hook up your electrodes and turn on the power supply. You'll want to run the gel at 110 volts for approximately 15 to 30 minutes. When you turn on the voltage, make sure you see bubbles in the running buffer. You can stop the gel once the dye bands have migrated approximately halfway through the gel, as shown here. You can then take the gel over to the UV light source and image your bands. Remember, UV light is dangerous. Make sure you're wearing proper eye protection. At any rate, once you turn on the UV light, your DNA band should start to fluoresce. Unfortunately, as you can see here, my DNA ladder appears to have degraded and is pretty useless in this gel. However, it looks like our PCR reaction worked quite well. We have two very bright bands in both of our sample lanes. If your PCR reaction hadn't worked, then you'd see nothing in these lanes. The next step in this process would be to extract these bands from the agarose gel. To see how that's done, please proceed to our video on gel extraction. Otherwise, proceed directly to our video on digestion.